Well, good morning, Kingsland. I, I hope that that worship this morning was as encouraging to you as it was to me. And can we just thank our choirs, the first time choirs back this fall? Can you, I mean, and, and just a shameless plug, like there is some extra space in the back. Like if, if some of you out there need to be part of choir, if, if you uh, just love worshiping Jesus uh, and just sharing that hope, that joy with others and letting that be contagious, this is a great spot to get plugged in uh, with a great group of people. And so you can talk to Pastor Michael after this service. He'd love to get you connected. Uh, this morning, we are back in the book of Malachi. We're going to be in Malachi chapter 2. If you were with us last week, you know that you can find Malachi by first finding Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, and turn in left uh, just a couple pages uh, to this short minor prophet of Malachi right there at the end of the Old Testament. As you're turning, I want to tell you about uh, a boat that you've heard about before. On April 14th, 1912, the RMS Titanic collided with a massive iceberg. This boat sank in less than three hours. At the time, there were more uh, than 2,200 passengers on board headed for uh, the United States on the maiden vo voyage. Most of you know this story. 705 survived. But according to builders of the Titanic, this was the unsinkable ship. It had the most advanced technology, the largest size, and, and the best design possible for a watercraft. So what in the world happened? Well, one of the researchers said this. There were 16 watertight compartments at the bottom of the ship that was supposed to seal off in the event of a hull breach that would make this ship unsinkable. But these watertight compartments were useless to countering the damage done by the collision with the iceberg. Some of the scientists that studied the disaster even concluded that the watertight compartments contributed to the disaster by keeping the floodwaters in the bow of the ship. They concluded if there had been no compartmentalization in the base of the ship, the incoming water would have spread out and the Titanic would have likely stayed horizontal. We're continuing our series called Revive this morning. Folks, compartmentalization almost always sounds like a great plan, but it almost always leads to disaster. That's what we saw in the example of the Titanic. Compartmentalization in our life isn't even really possible. You see, at every level, as we read this book, we're going to see that Israel has a broken faith. Their relationship with God has been severed, starting with their leadership. It moves into their community, and then finally it moves into their homes. We have much to learn from Israel this morning. And my prayer this week is that we will all be encouraged to live a life of spiritual integrity as we learn from God's warning, his challenges to Israel. Would you look on with me as we begin this morning? We're going to be Malachi chapter 2, starting right there in verse 1. Here's what he writes. Therefore, this decree is for you priests. If you don't listen and if you don't take to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of armies, I will send a curse among you and I will curse your blessings. In fact, I have already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. On the heels of chapter one, where we saw Israel in half-hearted worship, then they turn around and they're whining about how they're distant from the Lord, that, that he's not uh, blessing them, he's not walking with them. God sends this decree. He sends these commands that show us a glimpse of his heart and his expectations. He makes them very clear for us today. In warning the priests, God tells them to quit playing games and get serious about their calling. The first challenge that we're going to read about here is that these priests, and I believe that, that most of us, if not all of us today, challenge number one is that we need to model great leaders. We need to model great leaders. As Julius Campbell once said in the famous movie, Remember the Titans, attitude reflects leadership. Captain, anybody remember that movie? 
It's fantastic. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But attitude reflects leadership, Captain, and, and that is so true. Folks, if the leaders aren't right in the church, in the business, in the home, the rest of the organization, the rest of the family will follow. You see, all of Israel is a mess. But God is starting at the top. He's addressing the priests, the leaders of the nation. God is calling on them to look at their lives, to look at their leadership and their relationship with God. He says, it's time for you to take these words to heart. Otherwise, there are going to be significant consequences for everyone. As we looked at last week, these priests were allowing bad sacrifices. They were bringing poor sacrifices to to the Lord. They're whining about their experience, their their lack of experience with God's favor in, in their relationship. And God's warning for the priests is to shape up and to get right, to go back to what they know they're supposed to do. And if they don't, things are gonna go from bad to worse because we know in a nation, as the leader goes, so goes the nation. Speaking of leadership, And I recognize that that as we're reading, this is about the nation of Israel and and the priests that are there. And so I'm not trying to project what is happening there on our nation here. Uh, But I think we can all agree that uh, leadership matters. And leadership is influence. And if if leadership is influence, then one of the greatest privileges we have as, as Americans is we get the chance to have a say in the matter of who leads our nation and how our nation is led and how our nation is governed. So my encouragement to you is if you're not registered to vote, you go register to vote. October 7th, that's the last day you could register. You go to votetexas.gov, you can get that done. And and here's what you're never gonna hear from somebody at Kingsland, especially me. I'm I'm never gonna tell you how to vote, who to vote for, what to vote for, what matters to you. What I am gonna encourage you to do is vote as the Lord would lead you based on who we know him to be and what we see in his word. Every single one of us should be on our knees for the state of our nation. On November 4th, and we'll send more details out as that day gets closer, November 4th, we are going to uh, gather together on both campuses and spend some significant time in prayer for our leaders, for the election, for our nation, not to politicize God's word, but to ask that God would have his way in some of the most important offices in our land. More about that closer to time. Sorry for the tangent. Not sorry enough not to say it, but folks, leadership is important. And especially as we look at Israel and the priests, God tells them that there are consequences for their actions. But their consequences aren't just for them, their relationship with the Lord, their, their blessing, their benefit, but it's, it's also for their descendants. Let's keep reading in verse 3. He says, look, I'm going to rebuke your descendants And I will spread animal waste over your faces, the waste from your festival sacrifices, and you will be taken away with it. That's pleasant. (laughs) Friends, not only is compartmentalization unhealthy in the life of a follower of Jesus, but also like we saw with the Titanic, it's impossible for compartmentalization in our lives to, to work the way that we want it to work. We cannot keep one area of our lives separate and think that it's not going to affect everything else, other relationships, our heart, our mind, our attitude, our actions. God is warning that Israel's descendants, that's their children and their grandchildren, that they are going to experience the rebuke of God if they don't get their act together. And he goes a step further with some some really vivid language to tell him how displeased he is with the sacrifices that the priests are bringing right now. God says, your sacrifices are so worthless. I'm gonna smear this all over you and and not accept you, just like I'm not gonna accept your sacrifices. So what are the priests to do? 
I love the middle of, of this section here where God says, you've got to remember the great leaders that you had in the past, and you need to model their lives. As they followed me, you can follow them, and you can lead your nation, your people, your kids to do the same. Verses 4 through 7 remind these leaders of God's design. There's a covenant. That's a promise with actions and expectations for multiple parties. That's the most rudimentary definition of covenant that I can give you this morning. This morning. But this covenant was with the tribe of Levi, the lineage of the priests. God says that this covenant is one of life and of peace in verse 5. He says that Levi, he walked with God in in peace and integrity, and he led the nation to live in in those ways in a similar fashion in verse 6. Then he tells them that the, the role of a leader, the role of a priest, is to teach the things of God and to shepherd people towards a relationship with God of knowing who he is and experiencing him. We see that in 7 and 8. God is calling these leaders back to their original covenant with Levi. And then he reminds them in verses 8 and 9 that there are consequences. This is a warning that they cannot continue to turn away from the Lord and be a stumbling block for many. Because when they do that, they will bring about humiliation to themselves. Here's what he says. You, on the other hand, you have turned away. You've caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated that covenant of Levi, says the Lord of armies. So I, in turn have made you despised and humiliated before all the people because you are not keeping my ways, but you're showing partiality in your instruction. Friends, following a good leader is a powerful practice for any believer. But here's the tricky reality. Any person that you choose to follow will absolutely fail. They will let you down. They will lead you astray at some point. Any person that you choose to follow. It is inevitable because we all sin. We all have uh, our own mess. None of us are God. So I need you all to do something for me. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you are not God. And then then go ahead and tell them, neither am I. We're all a mess. Any great leader that we would follow, they are also a mess. But fortunately for all of us, God is overwhelmingly gracious to us in our failure. But also, if you have a relationship with God, if you've put your faith in him, your trust in him, you've given him your life, he has given you the Holy Spirit. That is God himself living in you. And that means that God can lead you. God can speak to you. God can bring to remembrance things from his word. God can comfort you. He can challenge you. Uh, His Holy Spirit, alive and well in you, brings his word to life in you. Shows you more of who he is. And allows you to live as you were designed to live. That doesn't mean we don't need to follow great leaders. If we want to grow in our spiritual integrity, we need to model great leaders. Whether that's people that we know who, again, we know are going to let us down. Or or we read about biblical heroes uh, and we model our lives after them. But as we keep reading, we see that there's another challenge from the Lord to the nation of Israel. Keep going. Malachi chapter 2, we're going to be in verse 10. He says, don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? Why then do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our ancestors? Judah has acted treacherously, and a detestable act has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. Folks, our relationship with the household of faith, that is the family of God, and in our context now we call that the church, is vastly important. The big complaint that God has here, we see right there at the end of verse 10, he says, why then do we act treacherously against one another? That word treacherously, it means unfaithful. It means not trustworthy. God is asking the nation of Israel, he says, why is there strife? Why is there disunity? Why are there complaints? Why is there unfaithfulness between the tribes? If we go back to the original covenant in Genesis 12, 
we're reminded of the purpose for the whole nation of Israel. Genesis 12, verse 2, God says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And don't miss these last words. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. All people on earth will be blessed through you. Israel is God's chosen people to know him, to walk with him, to hear from him. But the purpose wasn't that Israel would just become a better version of themselves or that they would become more important than everyone else on earth. That was never God's intended plan. God's design in choosing Israel from the very beginning was that they would become a blessing to the whole world because they would show everyone and tell everyone about the greatness of God. And right here in Malachi, he is calling out the tribes of Israel for the lack of love that they have between them. Instead of facing outward and showing people the greatness of God, they've turned inward and they are shooting arrows across the bow at each other, creating disunity and dysfunction. There's a lack of love. If we want to live a life of spiritual integrity, the next challenge that we see is that we must love the family of God. We must love the family of God. God reminds them that they have one father, that they have one creator, essentially saying, look, you're you're all the same. You're all part of the same family. No child of God is is any better than than another. And you know what? In the New Testament, they obviously didn't get it because Paul has to say the same thing to the church at Ephesus. Uh, He he says in, in Chapter 4, verse 3, to a bickering church, he says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you are called with one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Friends, it is impossible to overstate the importance of unity within the church, unity within the family of God. And if you think for a moment that you can hate your brother or sister in Christ privately and that it won't affect your relationship with the Lord or your relationships with the church, you are absolutely mistaken. Now look, we are all broken people in need of of the grace of God. But when there is disunity among the family, what we see right here in Malachi is that God rebuked them then. And I truly believe that he will rebuke us now. And so for some of you, that means that you need to go to your brother or sister today and ask for forgiveness. You have wronged somebody and you need to ask for forgiveness. And that's hard. There are others of you in here that somebody has wronged you, and instead of sitting back saying, well, when they come, we'll have a conversation, you need to approach them. You need to go and offer forgiveness. We have been forgiven much. We should forgive much. We should be people of grace because we are people who have experienced grace. There are others of you in here who just need to get connected to the family of God. Some of you in this room need to plant your feet here at Kingsland North Katy, and you need to get to know believers that are sitting next to you week after week when you come. Some of you are are just checking out the church, and, and maybe you're coming from another church because there's a problem, there's disunity, there's dysfunction, and you're running away from something. And, and can I say something that you may never have heard before? You need to go back to that church, and you need to repair those relationships, and you need to keep your feet planted with your family of faith that you're running away from. But wherever God has called your family, you need to jump in with both feet. And you need to love the community of faith around you. That means you need to be in Bible studies. You need to be in community group. You need to to just know your brothers and sisters that are sitting around you because you need community with other believers. And can I tell you a secret? That community 
needs you too. In fact, this coming Wednesday night, we have a, a special time uh, that we want to help our adults especially get to know each other, make some connections, and maybe feel a little more comfortable stepping into a community group or a Bible study. We're calling it Gather Nights. I think we've got three of them uh, this semester, but this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock is the first one. There's going to be food, and there's going to be fellowship. There's not going to be a sermon. Uh, I don't think there's going to be like any, any worship time, song, singing. It, it's going to be, hey, let's hang out. Let's get to know each other. Let's love each other well. Um, and, and that's for you. Whether you come on Wednesday nights normally or not, that's for you. Maybe you're in a class and, and you're just kind of hiding. You don't know anybody else. Can I just tell you, skip your class this week. Go get to know some people. Gather nights this Wednesday night at, at 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. If you are not connected and God has called you to this church, we want you to be there. Folks, we must love the family of God, not just because it's important for us, not just because it helps us walk closer with the Lord, but because our love for each other is one of the greatest testimonies of who Jesus is to the world around us. Jesus says this in John 13, 35. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. By this thing that I'm about to tell you, everyone will know that you follow me. If you love one another, your love for others, we got to love the family of God. And finally, we see our third challenge for the morning. If we want to grow in our spiritual integrity, we must, challenge number three, is remain faithful. We must remain faithful. Look at verse 11, the, the second half of the verse. For Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. I'm going to push pause for just a second. Just a side note of warning, or, or maybe uh, just an encouragement that stems from this verse. Folks, if you aren't married and you love Jesus, don't waste your time dating someone who isn't a believer. Don't waste your time with someone who's not a true follower of Jesus. Marriage is way too important to waste your time, your emotions on someone who doesn't love the person that you love the absolute most. That is Jesus Christ, your Savior. Can you be friends? Absolutely. Can you share your life? Can you tell them about Jesus? Absolutely. You, sh you should do that. But don't date them hoping that they will change because they won't. And we're going to see the, the, what happens when you do. Okay, end of rant. This marriage covenant is supposed to be the most special relationship that you have on this earth. It's the most special relationship that a person can experience while they're here on this earth. And because of that, marriage is also a powerful picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. We read about that in Ephesians 5. You can go read verses 22 through 31. Marriage is used throughout Scripture to help us better understand God's intense, passionate, and unconditional love for His bride, the church. That's you and me. However, what God is addressing here in Malachi 2 is not this symbolic relationship of marriage, but the actual abandonment of the marriage covenant that was rampant at this particular time in history. Because our marriages should display part of who our God is, our understanding of the sanctity of marriage is absolutely vital. You see, God established the nation of Israel and he commanded them not to intermar intermarry with other nations. It's a consistent theme throughout the Old Testament. And, and we see very clearly as God is preparing Israel to step into the promised land. In Deuteronomy 7, here's what he says. It doesn't get more clear than this. You must not intermarry with them. You must not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons because they will turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he will swiftly destroy you. Do you notice the heart behind this command? It isn't that God discriminates against other nations. 
Remember, Israel was to be a blessing to other nations, to the whole world. God loved people enough to send messengers to them. This isn't racial exclusivity. The problem with marrying someone who has a different belief system is that they have a completely different worldview than you do. For the Christian, all of life should be seen through the lens of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. An unbeliever, someone who doesn't trust Jesus, who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't worship him, cannot have that perspective. To marry someone without the same perspective is to enter a life of constant temptation to move away from God and towards the world. But as we have seen throughout Malachi, Israel takes this problem to a whole nother level. Not only were they intermarrying, but Israelite men were actually just discarding their Israelite wives, they were divorcing their Israelite wives so that they could intermarry. It's not just that the young guys were saying, oh man, I really want to marry these these people with other beliefs. It's, It's that the older men are saying, I'm done with this woman. I'd rather have that. So I'm going to throw her away and I'm going to chase this thing over here. And then like we saw with the priests and the sacrifices, these guys are bringing offerings to the temple and then they're crying, they're weeping. They actually have tears on the altar because God's not accepting their their offering. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. This is another thing you do. You ever been in a fight? You think the fight's over? Guys, this is, this is us. Like, we think the fight's over, and then your wife's like, and another thing. My wife comes to 11 o'clock. That part will not be at 11. You guys get that for free. Um, but God says, hey, this is another thing that you do. You are covering the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer accepts your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. And you ask, why? Why? Because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, there was a covenant. That's what he's saying right here. There was a covenant in your marriage between you, your wife, and God. Three-way covenant, never to be broken except through death. He says, got to find my spot. Between you and the wife of your youth, you have acted treacherously against her. She was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. God didn't make them one and give them a, a Didn't God make them one and give them a portion of spirit? What is the one seeking? Godly offspring. So watch yourselves so that no one acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. And if he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of armies. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. In these verses, God is bringing them back to his intention for marriage. It goes back to Genesis 2, 24, where he says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother, bonds with his wife, and, the, and they become one flesh. That's God's design. We didn't make that up in the church. We got it from God. One man, one woman, two becoming one, bound together forever as long as they both shall live. That's God's design for marriage from the very beginning. We see that word treacherously again right there in verse 14 because the Israelite men are being unfaithful and unfair to their wives. And God is reminding them, you have made a covenant, not only with their wife, but also with the Lord. And God commands them at the end of verse 15, he says, so watch yourselves carefully so that no one acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. He says, be careful. This stuff is serious. Folks, the challenge here is to remain faithful in marriage. And the rationale behind why that's important is seen in verse 16, which uh, if, if you do any study on this, you'll see that there's a little bit of disagreement among reasonable theologians at the exact 
purpose of these verses, but I believe this is the point. This is the overall idea that God is trying to communicate, that a man divorcing his wife due to hatred, boredom, frustration, lack of care and concern, it brings dishonor, a loss of integrity, and judgment upon himself. Friends, divorce under most circumstances in the sight of God is wrong. And I understand that we have families across this room who have walked through that, and that is hard. And we're going to talk about the grace and the mercy and the love and the healing that God has for that in just a moment. But to divorce for any reason other than infidelity and abuse, in my opinion, is to break the covenant of marriage that was made with your spouse and with God on that day that you committed your lives to each other. The final challenge that we see from chapter two is that our job is to remain faithful, to remain steadfast. And when the going gets tough, you fight one more day for your marriage. So I wanna take just a moment as we close to encourage us because Malachi, I've been telling a few people this morning, Malachi is like getting kicked in the stomach and then somebody else comes by and punches you in the stomach and then somebody comes by and spits on you. Like that's, that's how this book unfolds. So I want us all to be encouraged this morning because the reality is this room is full of broken, messed up, nasty, full of sin people. Every single one of us are carrying around the weight of our sin full of guilt, full of shame. In fact, if, if, you, if you knew the depth of my sin, you wouldn't come in here. And if we knew the depth of your sin, we probably wouldn't let you in. But Jesus Christ offers us grace and forgiveness that we can't earn and we do not deserve. It's one of the greatest things about our Savior that loves us so much. He forgives our failures. He forgives our mistakes. And when he looks at us through the lens of the cross and the empty tomb, he sees us as perfect, holy, and beloved. If you're a leader this morning and you lack integrity, can I just tell you? Jesus loves you, and he died for you. He wants to heal and restore you. If you're a believer this morning and you live in disunity with your brother or sister in Christ, can I just tell you that Jesus loved you, that he died for you, and he wants to restore that relationship not just for you and that other person, but for the whole world to know that he is good and capable and, and to be loved and honored and worshiped. He wants to heal and restore that. If you've been divorced and you're in here today, can I just tell you, Jesus loves you. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. There is grace and forgiveness for that. And his hope is a restored heart and mind and relationship, whether or not that means the marriage gets back together or not, that there should still be love and grace for each other. I believe that Jesus has great plans for every single one of us, regardless of our history. Because our God is full of grace, mercy, healing, and forgiveness. And if you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, there is no better day than today. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to clean yourself up first. You don't have to know every answer to every question and, and be some kind of theologian to come to Jesus. No, he wants you just where you are, just as you are. He stepped out of heaven. He came to this earth because he wanted to meet sinners like us right where we are. He just wants you. 
Romans 5, verse 8 says it this way. God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He proves his love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, if you have questions about anything you heard today, if you need prayer for things that are going on in your life, or if you'd just like to talk with somebody maybe about what it looks like to trust Jesus, as we sing one more song of response this morning, uh, we're going to have some folks available down front, and it would be an honor and a privilege to talk with any one of you. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the example that we see in, in how you dealt with Israel during a difficult season, a difficult time. God, I thank you that we can look to your word and, and it's not always rainbows and butterflies, but, but sometimes it's hard truths, it's challenging words, it's, it's things that, that hit us a little too close to home. And God, for the many of us who we feel like our, our toes have been stepped on this morning, God, I pray that, that we would just experience an overwhelming grace from you. God, that your expectation for us is not to be perfect, but that you just want our heart. Jesus, I thank you that there is grace in our failure. I thank you that there is forgiveness available all the time. And Jesus, I thank you most of all that you pursued us right where we are because we can't get to you on our own. Thank you for doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, paying the price for our sin and making us clean, whole, pure, and holy. And Lord, I pray for those who don't yet have a relationship with you that today would be the day that they say, I'm done playing the game. I'm done trying to look the part. Jesus, I wanna give you my whole heart and my life as jacked up as it is. Would you forgive me? Lord, have your way in this place. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.